questions. We're going to be looking at the unique aspects. Uh, obviously, uh, tonight we're looking at salvation, tomorrow night sanctification, the following night suffering, and then uh, Brother Des is going to conclude things by looking at grace age service. The common denominator, obviously, is this issue of grace age. So what we'll be doing tonight is looking at the this grace age salvation and the text passage that has been assigned to me is here in first Timothy chapter one. So if you would read along with me, I'd like to begin reading at verse 12. First Timothy chapter one, beginning at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who is before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit. For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you for the display of mercy and uh, the disposition of long suffering, which is uh, put on display during this current dispensation of grace. We pray, Lord, that we would have a firm grasp of the unique nature of the salvation that you uh, are now uh, offering. And uh, we pray that uh, we would be further established in the things of the faith. And uh, we just pray these things now in Christ Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Here the Apostle Paul says some pretty radical things. In fact, when you study God's word, you find that Scripture provides some of the most uh, uh, meticulous details surrounding the salvation of the Apostle Paul. You learn that there is such a careful, documented record of the salvation of the Apostle Paul. No less than three times we have uh, Paul giving an account of his salvation as recorded in the book of Acts. We have in his epistles no less than three major sections where Paul addresses his salvation. And then, of course, throughout his epistles, there are uh, a number of uh, references to his salvation. Uh, obviously, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, there really isn't any other event where Scripture provides such information and such detail. There is a critically important reason why the Lord would preserve such a detailed record of the Apostle Paul and his salvation. And we need to be very mindful of something. The Apostle Paul was not a messianic convert. The church at large, they assume that the Apostle Paul, he kind of eventually got saved like everybody else was getting saved under the gospel of the kingdom. Paul was not converted by Peter. He was not converted by the circumcision apostles. Paul was not converted by any member of the little flock. Critically important to recognize that Paul didn't just, you know, miss the turn, doubled back and then got on the right path. We're going to find out Paul could never have been saved under the Messianic Commission. He could never have been saved under the gospel of the kingdom. So there is a very important reason why God is chronicling these details surrounding the salvation of the Apostle Paul. And the reason simply is this. God is getting the attention of the church today by pointing at the unique nature, the unique conversion, the unique call and the unique commissioning of the Apostle Paul. So I hope that as we go through some of these verses and, and if there's some time now, now I know there's the threat of ice cream. And uh, if anybody promises to buy me ice cream, I'll end early. OK. Oh, no. OK, I will end. Early. <laughs> I was thinking hands will be flying up all over the place. Uh, we'll end early. I guarantee it. I, I hope if we have some time, I'd like to give a little quiz at the end 
of tonight's lesson. So I hope you follow along as carefully as you possibly can. All right. By the way, uh, just for giggles, I thought, you know, why don't I look at what some of the modern Bible translations uh, uh, read concerning the passage we just read? Uh, look at verse 16 once again. Look, notice verse 16. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first, I'm going to emphasize, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should, I'm going to emphasize this again, hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Out of curiosity, I pulled some of the modern Bible translations and uh, you can go online and and you can pull as many modern translations as you'd like. But I want to give you just a real brief sampling of what some of the modern translations say. For example, the NIV. We're all familiar with that translation. This is how the NIV reads. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy that so that in me, the worst of sinners Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, if you're listening carefully, you'll note the word first is missing, but also the word hereafter is missing. And you're going to find out that the vast majority of modern Bible translations eliminate the word first, but equally alarming they eliminate the word here after the ESV, another highly popular version. This is how the ESV, the English Standard Version reads. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul isn't the first. He's described as being foremost. What happens is they're taking you back to verse 15, where Paul calls himself the chief of sinners in the sense of he's the ranking sinner, as in chief, uh, joint chiefs of staff or commander in chief. Um, the NAS uh, uh, Bible, the uh, New American Standard, again, yet for this reason, I found mercy that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So again and again, and you look at they eliminate the word first. And they simply assume that what verse 16 is referring to is nothing more than what Paul uh, ends verse 15 by writing, whom I am chief. And so that tells you right off the bat, if you have the Lord who finds it highly important to preserve a very detailed record and account of Paul's conversion or salvation, that there is something God is communicating. What is it that God is communicating when he keeps pointing to what happened to Paul as it's recorded there in Acts chapter nine on the road to Damascus? Because God tells us something happens for the very first time. And whatever happens with Paul first is now a pattern for them who should hereafter believe on him unto eternal life. So uh, there's a reason why Paul makes a real big deal about his salvation. And verse 16 is pretty simple. There's something that is happening for the very first time. Now, Paul, in verse 16, he tells us that he is a pattern. Uh, Paul is a federal representative, meaning that what happens to Paul is also what is true of us. What is true with Paul is true of us. If we want to study grace, age, salvation, we need to study how is it that Paul got saved. To know, the, to know one is to know the other. If you know how Paul was saved, we'll understand what grace, age, salvation is all about. So when the title for this evening's lesson uh, is Grace, Age, Salvation, this is the text where we have to go. We want to find out, well, how did Paul 
get saved. And I'm going to emphasize again, Paul says, in me first. And we're going to find a verse in the book of Acts where, wait a minute, Peter says somebody else was supposed to get it first. So why does Paul go around and, and, and write uh, in me first? Now, Paul's a pattern in three ways. We're not going to look at all three of them, but Paul is a pattern of our past. Paul is also a pattern uh, in the present. And Paul is also a pattern for our future. So when Paul calls himself a pattern, you understand what a pattern is. It's, it's sort of like that prototype. It's, it's this uh, 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 sample, if you will, not really a sample. But uh, he stands as a type, as a representative. So let's go back real quickly to verse 13 and let's establish Paul's past because Paul is a figure of our past. In fact, Paul typifies our past status as Gentiles, which then means whatever happens to Paul. And if he says in me first, we learn something about the way Paul gets saved as a representation of how the Gentiles are getting saved. If we look back there at verse 13, Paul describes himself who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul describes himself in the past as an enemy. When Paul uses this language, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was an injurious and so forth. He's not just being uh, self-deprecating. Uh, he's not just trying to be humble. That isn't what Paul is doing at all. Paul is describing a legal status that was true of him before God. What Paul is describing is a Status before God in a legal sense. Paul is demonstrating he was worthy of wrath as a blasphemer, as one who hunted down those believers of Messiah, as one who was injurious, one who operated in ignorance. He was disqualified. He was found guilty at the judgment of bar of Almighty God. Hence, he could not have been saved in the prophetic program. In fact, he's going to use language that's going to demonstrate he could, he could not have been saved under the gospel of the kingdom. Now, if we read here in verse 13, he talks about being a blasphemer. That obviously would take us back to Matthew chapter 12. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. And, and we learn something about uh, being a blasphemer. To be a blasphemer means to speak against. And the Lord Jesus back here in Matthew chapter 12, he warns the nation about speaking against the Holy Spirit, about of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So here in Matthew chapter 12, we're not going to cut right into the context. Notice there verse 31, Matthew 12, verse 31. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, what, is, what do you mean? What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Um, you know, you, you hear people use the Lord's name in vain. You hear uh, people use uh, the name of Jesus Christ in a very casual, carnal way. What does it mean to blaspheme the name of of the Holy Ghost. I mean, is the Lord threatening anybody who uses the name of the Holy Ghost in an ungodly way or in a carnal? Uh, what is it that the Lord is referring to? What the Lord is warning the nation of is rejecting the testimony of God, the Holy Ghost, rejecting the ministry of. And work of God, the Holy Ghost. During this period of time, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the nation is already rejecting the testimony 
of Jesus Christ. They're blaspheming the name of Jesus, not simply because they're using his name in vain or anything like that, but they're rejecting his ministry. They're rejecting his message. They're rejecting the signs that are associated with the gospel uh, or the good tidings of the kingdom, so on and so forth. So the Lord Jesus, he's now beginning to conduct his ministry in light of his rejection. The nation's rejecting his claims. He's warning the nation, don't reject the claims of who? The Holy Ghost. Uh, Keep reading verse 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So the question is, was the Holy Ghost blasphemed? Now remember, the Apostle Paul says, I was a blasphemer. By the way, he's guilty of committing two acts of blasphemy. He blasphemed the Lord Jesus Christ and he's guilty of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, let's fast forward very quickly to Acts chapter two. The Lord Jesus, in preparation of his rejection and in preparation of the coming of the Holy Ghost, as recorded in Acts chapter two, is telling the nation of Israel, listen, you better receive the testimony of the Holy Ghost. And we, of course, have in history the ministry and the testimony of the Holy Ghost here in Acts chapter 2, obviously verse 1, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And and, uh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues. We're not going to get into it. So the Holy Ghost manifest himself. How? By imparting into these apostles. The capacity to what? To speak. Again, to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Isn't to call the Holy Ghost a bad name. It's to reject the testimony of the Holy Ghost. He immediately is going to begin his ministry by giving the capacity of communicating to various languages. And that's exactly why the gift of tongues is even given. Because obviously there in Jerusalem, there were men out of all nations, devout men, Jews. Okay, so remember, the Holy Ghost is now going to commence his ministry to the nation of Israel. And it's interesting, it begins with the gift of tongues. Drop down to verse 16, verse 16. And of course, uh, Peter now is going to be ridiculed. And, 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 and as the audience begins to hear uh, some things and, and they're accusing Peter and the others of being drunk. Verse 16, here's what Peter says. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. Upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall what prophesy again. You you see what the Holy Spirit is now beginning to do. He's going to communicate in various languages. He's now going to conduct this ministry of visions and prophesying. There is this urgent revelation and communication of things that the prophet Joel is predicting. So what did the Lord Jesus warn against? Don't blaspheme against him. Don't reject his testimony. Don't speak against What the Holy Ghost is going to be doing. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 7. And uh, over a course of time, a relatively short period of time, approximately one year, we have in in Acts chapters 1 through Acts chapter 7, a record of the nation of Israel 
believing or rejecting the testimony of Peter, the testimony of the little flock. We have a record of the nation of Israel officially rejecting the Holy Ghost filled ministry of Peter and the disciples and the members of the little flock. Listen, they rejected God. They rejected the whole uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. They crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what they're now doing in light of the testimony of God, the Holy Ghost. They're rejecting him. And it all comes to uh, this this culminating point where you have Stephen and and there's a there's a, a miracle that happens. He has a face like an angel and then he's filled with who, by the way, in Acts chapter seven, the Holy Ghost. And in light of 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 uh, uh, Stephen being filled, look there at verse 51 of Acts chapter seven. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist who? The very warning Jesus issues to the nation. Is now being committed at the hands of the nation. You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye drop down to verse 55. But he being full of the who Holy Ghost. So when the Apostle Paul says, I was a blasphemer, he was no friend of Jesus Christ. He was no friend of that messianic message. He was no friend of the little flock. He did not believe the events and the declarations and the communication and the testimony and the preaching and the supernatural phenomenon recorded there in Acts chapter. He didn't believe any of that. He rejected it. Paul calls himself a blasphemer because of of a warning that the Lord Jesus gave. And we're in Acts chapter seven. Drop down quickly to verse 58. And cast. Well, we ought to understand what's going on when when in verse 56, Stephen filled with the Holy Ghost. Look what Stephen says in verse 56 and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. uh, uh, And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Whose name was who? Now, Saul was not a a coat checker. Think about it. Here you have Israel's leadership holding a, a meeting, if you will, interrogating Stephen. And Stephen, he's he's his face is shining like an angel. By the way, every opportunity of repentance is connected to a visible sign. They see something happening to Stephen. And Stephen is filled with the Holy Ghost and they're rejecting the claims of Stephen. And Stephen says, you've always rejected the claims of God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Ghost. So enraged. We're going to kill this guy. But they put their clothes at the feet of who? Now, why? What? What? what, what again, what, what, who is this guy? Saul. Why did they Why did they make the effort to lay their clothes at his feet? You know, it was no coincidence. It was Saul's feet. They knew who this guy was. In fact, look there at chapter eight, verse one. And Saul was consenting unto his death. The wording here would suggest that these men They looked to Saul and out of respect and honor, they laid their garments down at his feet. And he wasn't there on a whim. He was there on an official capacity. And they were actually looking for affirmation, confirmation. What do you why would it matter whether Saul gave his consent? This is what we need to recognize about Saul. 
Saul was not a friend. What, what is Saul doing during the course of early Acts? He's already got a reputation. They know who he is. They receive consent from Saul. We read there again, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And all that time, there was a great, persecu- uh, a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men scattered. Uh, I'm sorry, carried Stephen to his burial and made great uh, lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made what? Did he on the spur of the moment decide? You know, I think I'm going to go after the church. He's doing what he was already doing. When they laid his, their garments at his feet, they already knew what reputation he had. He was functioning in an official capacity. Hence, they said, do we get your consent? And he more than gladly gave his consent. Another victory. We killed another counterfeit, another fraud. We killed another heretic as far as Saul was concerned in light of who Stephen was. If you go over to chapter nine, go to chapter nine and, and, and throughout the book of Acts, we, we have emphasis laid upon Saul's career, a career of rebellion. You see, Remember, Paul says, I was a blasphemer in the face of what the Holy Ghost is doing. I, too rejected and resisted and actually consented to the death of Stephen. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, uh, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound Unto Jerusalem. Drop down to verse 13. Then Ananias uh, answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. This guy had quite a reputation. Chapter 22, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 22. Listen, what the Apostle Paul is doing when he writes to Timothy, preparing Timothy for the impending apostasy, he reminds them, don't forget my past, because my past is a pattern of the Gentiles. And we're going to see that in just a minute. Paul says, I was I was an enemy. I rejected God. I rejected the Holy Ghost. I was injurious. I'm a persecutor. He writes to, uh, to the Galatians and he says, listen, I laid the church waste. I'm destroying it. That's what a rebel does. That's what an unbeliever does. That is what an enemy does. So Paul, he, he deliberately is reminding Timothy, don't forget who I am. And remember, he is a pattern. He's a federal represent. He, he's a representation of us. In Acts chapter 22, notice there verse four. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Man, you talk about no shame. Verse five, and also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to uh, Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Chapter 26, chapter 26. And notice there in Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 4 and 5. Verse 4, my manner of, of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which know me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, 
I lived a Pharisee. Drop down to verse 9. I verily thought with, by, with who, by the way? Myself. He's operating as his own authority. I, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And then verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Doesn't that sound like Acts chapter eight, verse one? After those leaders laid down their clothes at the feet of Saul. And it says that Saul was consenting. You see, Paul isn't doing anything new after the stoning of Stephen. He's simply carrying out what he already thought in himself to do. He said, I was more zealous than my peers. He did it with bloodless. He did it with passion. He did it with, with zealousness, destruction, mayhem. I persecuted them even on to strain. Now, let's read verse 11. And I punished them uh, 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 of and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even on two strange cities. What the Apostle Paul is doing, going back to First Timothy chapter one, Paul is establishing who he was in the past. And, and again, th this is Paul demonstrating that he was a bitter enemy. And as a bitter enemy, he was disqualified, as the Lord Jesus said, it is going to be forgiven you. The book of Acts records Paul as Saul fighting and resisting against what Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, taught. So when we read verse 13, who is before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in. And this is important. He did it how in unbelief. So so get the picture here. Go, go back to Acts chapter seven. So we understand uh, what is Paul doing? During well, after well, I, I would go even as far as during the Lord's earthly ministry, but but certainly as recorded in the book of Acts, Paul is launching an active campaign of destruction, death. He's trying to destroy this way, this church that believed in Jesus of Nazareth. Going back to Acts chapter seven, notice there as Stephen, of course, he uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. He he uh, condemns the nation of Israel. And it says there again in Acts seven, verse fifty five. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is now standing. And I hope we understand the significance of the Lord Jesus standing. Didn't Peter there in Acts chapter two, he quotes the Psalms and there in Acts chapter two, might as well turn there. It's only a few pages away in Acts chapter two. Notice. As Peter rebukes and confronts the nation of Israel. We read there in Acts chapter 2 verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself. The Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou on my right hand. Until I make thy foes. Uh, thy foes thy what? So, so I want you to sit. Until when? Until it's time to destroy. Your foes. So just grasp this this moment in history in Acts chapter seven. The Holy Ghost is officially rejected by the nation of Israel. Saul as a leader of that nation 
is giving his official consent and approval for Stephen to die. And while that's happening, Stephen looks up and he sees Jesus standing. And the reason he's standing is in fulfillment of what the Psalms say. Why don't we go over to the book of Psalms? Go over to Psalms uh, chapter um, uh, 68. Go to Psalms chapter 68. And, and, you know, there are a couple of ver- Well, there's four or five verses in the book of Psalms that explain why the Lord would even stand up. Psalms chapter 68. Notice there at verse one, Psalm 68, verse one, let God arise. Why? Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Think about this in Acts chapter seven. Stephen sees the Lord standing. But who was scattered in Acts chapter eight, verse one? The church was scattered. According to Psalms chapter 68, the Lord said the Lord's going to rise up. And you know what the result of the Lord rising up is? His enemies are going to be what? It didn't happen, folks. Historically, Jesus is standing because the father said, it's time now to make your foes a footstool. The crushing fury of God's just wrath against who? His enemies. And the enemies are going to flee. The enemies are going to scatter. But it didn't happen. But Jesus did stand up. Go over to chapter uh, 74. Psalms chapter 74. And notice there at verse 10. Psalms chapter 74. And notice there at verse 10. O oh God. How long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? What did Paul call himself? A blasphemer. What is the nation of Israel doing? As recorded in the book. They're blaspheming. Listen, Lord, you're supposed to stand up. And when you stand up. It's time for retribution. It's time for vengeful wrath as predicted by prophetic scripture. Go to Psalms 110, chapter 110. And notice there in Psalms chapter 110. And uh, once again, we we have uh, something regarding the Lord rising up. Psalms chapter 110, verse 1, which is the quote that we uh, find in Acts chapter 2. Psalms 110, verse 1, the Lord said... Unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine what? Wait a minute. Peter's warning. He quotes this passage in Acts chapter 2. And we've seen some verses in the book of Psalms. Listen, the Lord's going to stand up. All right. He's going to demolish. He's going to he's going to eradicate all of these enemies. They're the ones that are going to scatter. And then, Lord, you're going to rule. It didn't happen. But the Lord did stand up, did he not? Go to one more verse. Zephaniah, Zephaniah. And and notice Zephaniah chapter three, Zephaniah chapter three. And uh, and notice there Zephaniah chapter three and verse eight. Zephaniah chapter three, verse eight. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the what? Oh, you know, we have a hawk in our backyard. Uh, It's a Cooper hawk. Uh, We have Cooper hawks and red tail hawks. But we have this Cooper hawk was born in one of the trees uh, behind our yard there. Right. And so we actually got to see this little Cooper hawk grow up. And, you know, I think hawks are really cool. I, I like birds of prey. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not a sickle or more, but I hope. But, you know, I don't know. I think it is such a sight to see this thing just swoop down and snatch little birds. <laughs> I mean, uh, but I've seen it do it. All right? I've seen it do it. And, yet, hey, hey, it's life, right? Circle of life, right? I mean, hey, more power to them, you know. But, I mean, just, just to, 
the way it just maneuvers the aerodynamics, it, it, the, a bird of prey. The Lord, catch what verse 8 is saying. The Lord's going to rise up to the what? To the prey. Wait a minute. Did the Lord rise up in Acts chapter 7? But did he rise up to the prey? Now keep reading verse 8, by the way. Uh, the day I, that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Here's the point. The Apostle Paul as a federal representation, a pattern of our status as Gentiles. Listen, God made a promise in the prophetic scriptures that one day I'm rising up. And when I rise up, I'm rising up to the prey. I'm coming down to swoop upon the nations, the enemy Gentiles, those enemies of God, those enemies of Israel, those enemies of Messiah. Paul is using language to identify himself with who? The very enemies that prophecy describes. Paul could never have been saved under the messianic ministry of Jesus Christ and his apostles. It is an absolute impossibility. Go back now to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And the reason I really want to stress this is because we'll never truly appreciate the magnitude of what the Lord now is going to do. All we know about prophecy, all that Peter preached in the opening chapters of Acts is watch out. Retribution is coming. The wrath is coming. Save yourself from this untoward generation. He's going to stand up. He's going to wipe out his enemies. He's going to just disintegrate. Jesus stood up. And yet. The heavens went silent. It's been that way for 2000 years. But what we rather see is Saul continuing. His career as a. Enemy of God. Now go back to first Timothy. Timothy. Chapter 1, and now let's read verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. What happened to the destruction of the adversary? Something happened here. Paul understands I was worthy of destruction. But wait a minute. The nations were worthy of destruction. Something happened. Uh, quickly go to Galatians chapter 1. And, and Paul, he, he describes exactly what happened. Something so unprecedented happened. Something so radically unique. Something occurred in human history which just shook the foundation. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Galatians 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. (laughs) Galatians 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. My apologies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And of course here, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remaineth unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Now, I want you to just Remember, Paul's going to use this language, due time, a number of times. He uses language like due time, accepted time, appointed time. Why is Paul so into time? Why is he so into time? But, but, but not just any time, the right time, the appropriate time, due time. Here, he describes witnessing the resurrected Lord in Jesus Christ, but He describes it as of one born out 
of what? Well, wait, well, wait a minute. Then if, if it's out of the due time, then it's not in the appropriate time. So something's not going, something's wrong. Put it this way. Um, well, my daughter-in-law just had a baby. I guess the normal gestation for a pregnant woman is 280 days. We have a nurse over 280 days, 40 weeks. Not that I counted when my daughter-in-law, but uh, the, the normal gestation for a pregnant woman is 280 days. So when they talk about the due date, they look at that 280 day period. Paul says, I saw him as of one who is born according to the normal gestation period or out of the normal. You see, when he says I was born out of, in other words, what does it mean to be born out of due time? Something happened to Paul. If you want to go to Job chapter three, Job chapter three, the the language being born out of due time is very descriptive of a violent death. Paul was still born. Something abnormal happened to the apostle Paul. But but there's a time period when Paul uses the language out of due time. Listen, God has a very intricate calendar. I mean, my goodness, you read the book of Daniel, right? Daniel chapter nine. I mean, how, how many weeks are determined upon thy people Israel? Somebody, and then, you know, you study it and, and you've got the, the weeks of weeks and you have 62 weeks and then you have the remaining seven weeks and so forth. And, and you know, you go the, the, the book of I mean, in God's word, God lays out a very precise calendar by which the nation of Israel could follow. When Paul begins to describe the events that happened to him on the road to Damascus, his salvation, he says, man, things are absolutely out of whack here. Nothing's going according to the time schedule. It's out of due time. Something abnormal is taking place here in Job chapter three, just so that we uh, uh, understand this language of being born out of due time in Job chapter three. If you notice there at verse one, Job chapter three, verse one, after this opened Job, his mouth and cursed his day. OK, you understand he, he he's cursing. He's he, he's angry, frustrated, whatever you want to call it. Drop down to verse 11, verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Drop down to verse 16. Or as an hidden, untimely birth. You see that untimely? If you're born out of due time, is it timely or untimely? It's untimely. Something's wrong here. So when Paul uses that language, born, he's not born alive. He's using language as verse 16. As an hidden, untimely birth, I had not been. As infants which never see what or saw what. This, this fetus is dead. An untimely birth is a birth that occurs outside. Of the normal due time gestation period. It's violent. You understand how Paul is describing what happened to him when he saw the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Paul likens that event as death. Death. Did Paul die there in Acts chapter 9? Go to Galatians chapter 1 now. It's interesting if Paul recognized that, you know, I I was a blasphemer and I I, I was hunting down the church and I was destroying the church. I was laying the church waste. He was an enemy of almighty God. And when Jesus Christ stood up there, boy, you you, I'm just boy. The Lord Jesus could have looked right at Saul, right in the eyeballs. He could have, you know, Stephen saw the Lord standing at the right hand of God and Saul, Saul is standing there. He didn't see out of his, I'm not suggesting he saw anything. But but here's the the, the leader 
the chief of sinners leading this campaign of violence and destruction. And yet when Paul describes what happened to him, he says, wait a minute. Look at Galatians chapter one, verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and, and wasted it and profited in the Jews religion above many mine equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Look at verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's what? Listen, the Lord wasn't there waiting for a delivery. God reached down and violently snatched Paul from out of Israel, out of the prophetic program. Paul was put to death to the prophetic program. And, and, and why so? Paul is a pattern Paul, it, 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 something is happening. We'll go back to First Timothy chapter one. We're going to move quick. First Timothy chapter one, and 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 notice, Paul says, "I was the last to see him, as of one born out of due time." The Lord separated me from my mother's womb. Reference to the nation of Israel. Listen, the Lord deliberately put Paul to death in relationship to Israel and her prophetic hope and her prophetic program. Why did the Lord do that? To Saul at the time, Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first. If we want to appreciate verse 15 and how it is Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, Paul says, of whom I am chief, I'm that leading rebel. He then says, because I'm the first, I'm the first. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him. To life everlasting. Just as Paul is a type and a figure and a pattern of the past as a blasphemer. Do you know that we as Gentiles also were equally the enemies of almighty God? Now go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And uh, in Romans chapter 5, Paul when he describes, of course, the love of God. And, and you know what? Over and over, you re, listen, God's love is put on display. You know, people who, who, who are criticized dispensationalism and they say, oh, you know, oh, you, it's a hobby horse and all you ever do is worship Paul, make a big deal out of Paul, 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 Paulology and all that kind of stuff. Listen, the, the, the Lord makes a big deal out of the salvation of the Apostle Paul. The Lord is the one who says, I'm doing something for the very first time in and through him. The Lord is the one who's saying, I'm using Paul as a pattern for them who should hereafter believe. Listen, the Lord is making a big deal out of this. And, and, you know, the Lord actually calls it my glory. OK, but anyway, the Lord, it's his love. God, the father is expressing and manifesting his love by doing something for the very first time, apart from anything he promised to do in the prophetic system. He's doing something just completely different. And you. In Romans chapter five, Paul, of course, in verse five, he talks about the love of God. But look at verse six, Romans chapter five, verse six. For when we were yet what? In what sense were we without strength? And you know what it means to be without strength. I mean, Paul, when we were helpless. Think about that for a second. Paul as a blasphemer, injurious, persecuting, destroying, laying away the church. Did Paul have any standing before God? Did he have any status before God short of being an enemy? Did, was there any legal claim that God, that Paul could ever have made with God. When Paul here says we were without strength, in what sense were we without strength? And by the way, we need to also note that in chapter five, Paul is dealing with periods of time. For example, look at verse 14. Verse 14. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to who? Now, do you notice how Paul, he, he's, he's referring to periods of time. If you want to call it dispensations, I don't have a problem calling it. There are dispensational time periods that Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 5. My point is this. When Paul says, when we were, th- we were without strength, I use it when I deal with people individually. There's an individual application. But, you know, there is a dispensational application that Paul is making here. We learn something about what's happening between Adam and Moses. If you go drop down to verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might what abound. When Paul says we were without strength, what he is saying is this. We had no legal standing before God. We could make no claims there was no legal defense. There was no way we could ever exonerate ourselves before we were with without. And you know why we were without strength? You know what? Keep your finger here. Go to Ephesians chapter two. The reason we are without strength. In the legal sense. We, we had no standing. We had no defense. What in the world are we going to argue? What do we present to the court? To be without strength means there is nothing. And then we're going to find out what it means to be without strength. But but look there in Ephesians 2 verse 11. Whereunto remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Well, what's the big deal? Look at verse 12 that at that time ye were what? You know why we were with out strength we were without christ go back to romans chapter 5 and and what i see paul now beginning to do here he's going to describe what it means to be without strength we didn't have any claim we had no argument he says in verse 6 for when we were yet without strength notice in what Here's that due time again. Okay, in due time. Wait a minute. At the appropriate time. At the right time. It does not say when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly, does it? It says when we were without strength, in what? Due time. There is an appropriate right period of time. In which we're going to learn something about the full effect and accomplishments of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul is going to say some things about what was merited at Calvary that nobody else talks about. So you understand why Paul says in me first. God is revealing some things for the first time in and through the instrumentality of Paul. The reason we're without strength, number one, in due time, Christ died for who? We're without strength because, number one, we're ungodly. You know why else we're without strength? Look at verse eight. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were what? Sinners. Christ what? Died for who? Us. Nobody ever revealed this system of truth before until Paul got it. From the Lord Jesus. And then there's a third reason why we're without strength. Look at verse 10. For if when we were what? We're without strength because we are ungodly. Because we are sinners. And because we are enemies. Those are legal pronouncements. Don't ever forget the book of Romans. It's a forensic environment. There is a legal courtroom battle taking place. If you want to call it a battle. There is this back and forth. There's some le- there's forensic language being tossed all over the place. To be without strength is a result of number one being ungodly. You know where we find out when God viewed Gentiles as ungodly? Go to Romans chapter one. The book of Romans is already has already told us. God's declared Gentiles ungodly. God has already viewed Gentiles as sinners and that God has already deemed Gentiles as enemies. And that's established in chapters one, chapter two and chapter three. 
So by the time Paul writes chapter five, his emphasis is in his emphasis is you want to know how much God loves you? While we were yet what? Without strength. Don't forget chapter one. We're ungodly. Look, Romans chapter one, beginning there at verse twenty one. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man. You see the issue of the image. We don't when God created Adam and whose image was Adam created in the image of God, in the like that, you know, God Lee, God like in the likeness of God. Adam was created in the likeness and image of almighty God. So what does man do historically? They take the image of the uncorruptible God, verse 23, and changed it into uh, an image made like to corruptible man and the birds and four footed beast and, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up. So from this point on, Romans chapter one is a legal declaration of the Gentile status in their attempt to carnalize the glory of almighty God. It's the Gentiles that are ungodly. But then Paul says, we're also what? Sinners. Look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 2. Notice there in Romans chapter 2 and uh, verse 12. Romans chapter 2 verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also, also perish how? Without law. Listen, were the Gentiles ever given the Mosaic law? Are they still found guilty of sinners? That's what Paul's going to demonstrate. We're without strength. We're ungodly. God's already abandoned the Gentiles. But not only that, according to Romans chapter 2, God deems Gentiles to be sinners. Remember what Paul writes or when he confronts Peter in the face and as he's argumenting with Peter and he says, you know, we, you and me, Peter, we're not as sinners of the who? The Gentiles. I notice that. Interesting, Paul and Peter are engaged in some uh, Jewish discourse and they agree we're not like the sinners of the Gentiles. Uh, verse 12 again, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law for not the hearers of the law are judged are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts. The meanwhile, accusing. you know what this passage is saying? Even if the Gentiles don't have a codified system of law, are, are they still deemed sinners? Yes. As Gentiles, are we sinners? Historically, legally, according to Romans chapter two. So we're without strength. And then Paul says we're enemies, are we not? Look there at Romans chapter three. And we're going to really going to have to wind it up. Romans chapter three. Look there at verse nine. What then? Are we better than they? Are, are we Jews? Paul's, are, are we as Jews better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under what? So what Paul's going to do really, really quickly, if you study the, the, the next uh, verses uh, 16 down through verse 18, Paul is using a bunch of verses from the book of Psalms, book of Isaiah and so forth. Paul is demonstrating that both Jews and Gentiles are guilty. But it's really interesting if you find the skillful use of these passages. For example, look there at verse 10 as it is written. Now, what Paul does here from verses 10 through verse 12 is he's going to quote out of Psalms chapter 14. Why do I say that for sake of time? Read verse 10 as it is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Those verses are a reference to Gentiles. If you go back to Psalms chapter 14. Here's my point. 
Romans 1 declares Gentiles ungodly. You're not on my, you're without me. Romans chapter 2, you Gentiles are still sinners, even if you don't have a codified system. And then Paul here in chapter 3 is using passages to demonstrate that the Gentiles are the declared legal enemies of Almighty God. By going back to passages like Psalm 53 and Psalm chapter 14. Isn't it fascinating? Now go back to Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For when we were yet without strength. Paul's already demonstrated that. We had no historic claim. We had no legal claim. And we had no spiritual claim to Almighty God. We're cut off. We're alienated. We're without God having how much hope in this world? No hope. We are in a pickle, (laughs) to say the least. We're toast. Now, we're going to, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen Stone, when the Lord Jesus stood there, According to prophecy, it was now time to destroy these ungodly, sinful enemies of Almighty God. That includes certainly historically the Gentiles. It also includes the apostate nation of Israel. Everything, the world was on the brink of doom and destruction. You understand what you understand what was happening in Acts chapter seven? The world was on the brink of catastrophic destruction as the Lord's day of wrath was set to begin. But you know what God did instead? He violently ripped that leader Saul right out of the womb of Israel, put him to death. The prophecy, because through the instrumentality of Paul, God reveals something called the mystery. Paul called it's the dispensation of the grace of God. And this is what God is demonstrating. And we're going to go close it all up. Go with first Timothy chapter one, first Timothy chapter one, first Timothy chapter one, what the Lord is revealing. And nobody prior to Paul knew anything about this. So the language needs to be retained. And regardless of what the modern Bible translations are doing by eliminating Paul being first. Verse 16. First Timothy chapter one and verse 16. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Drop down to chapter two, verse five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified when. You see the due time? He uses similar language in Titus. Here's the point. When Paul describes that event, his salvation, it's a pattern of the salvation that God extends and offers to the entire world. He offers salvation not to the righteous, not to those who are seeking, not to those who try hard, not to those who are sincere, not to those who who are doing their. He is extending salvation to all based upon his love, his grace, his mercy, his long suffering through the Apostle Paul. For the very first time, we truly do learn the depths of Calvary, the full effect of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were without strength because when Jesus showed up on planet Earth, he came onto his own. He came to die. He came to to deal with the sins of the nation of Israel. Why did Jesus say, go not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel? We were without strength. We were without him. We were without hope. We were without God. God does something with Paul to demonstrate how he now offers salvation to an entire world. And, you know, he's been doing it for 2000 years. I said I wanted to give you a little quiz. And uh, so let me ask you this. All right. Real quickly. I know I want the ice cream. Um, (laughs) If Paul says I'm the first and he does. And he says, I'm the first as a pattern for all of them that should hereafter believe. 
Do we find great saved salvation in John chapter 3, verse 16? Why? Because who said I'm first? Huh? Do we find salvation in Matthew chapter 20? They that endure unto the end shall be saved. Well, is there grace, sal grace, aid, salvation? Do we find grace, aid, salvation in Mark chapter 16, verse, uh, was it 16 or so? He who believeth and is baptized. Is no. Be who said they're first? Do we find grace, aid, salvation in Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Why? Who said I'm the first? Do we find grace, aid, salvation in James chapter 2? You know, are you, by, by works you're justified. No. Paul said, I'm the first. Father, we do thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you, Lord, that your saving grace is first made known through the Apostle Paul. May we defend uh, that, that uh, ministry, that message. And uh, we just thank you, Father, for your love, your goodness, your grace. And we thank you for in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.